Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the third podcast of the 2016 through 2017 TCN podcast series. This is Erin Bowles-Welsh, Tobacco Control Program Manager for the Rhode Island Department of Health and also the current Tobacco Control Network Chair-elect. Today, I'm joined by Allison Myers from Counter Tools, Cassandra Stepan from the Minnesota Department of Health, and Derek Smith from the San Francisco Department of Public Health. We're excited to bring you to this third, uh, this third pro- podcast, Opportunities for Point-of-Sale Policy in Tobacco Control. I'd like to introduce Dr. Allison Myers, who will provide us with a national perspective on point-of-sale policy. Allison serves as the Executive Director at Counter Tools, Inc., a nonprofit organization that provides data collection and visualization technology, training, and technical assistance to retail-focused tobacco prevention policy enactment in 18 U.S. states. Counter Tools continues to develop and pilot program offerings in place-based health promotion with regard to food, physical activity, alcohol, marijuana, and public safety. Dr. Myers leads research and practice activities in local public health policy implementation, tobacco and food environment measurement, and policy-related news media content analysis. Allison, thanks for joining us here on the TCN podcast. Hi. Thanks so much for having me, Erin. I'm glad to be a part of it. Thanks for TCN for organizing. Uh, I am excited for us to be together in the podcast to talk about opportunities for point-of-sale policy and tobacco control. Uh, And there are just a couple of points that I would want to make uh, for the listeners. One is that we are certainly stronger together, uh, that what we're learning across states with lots of different settings, whether they have different legal landscapes or varying degrees of political will, uh, and even as we are pursuing lots of different point-of-sale policies, there's a lot uh, for us to learn uh, from each other. And I know one of the best things that I do, uh, that I get to do, I should say, at Counter Tools is to hear from uh, lots of states, not just the ones with which we work more intensely, uh, but really from folks across the U.S. about how they're thinking about point-of-sale and how they're doing point-of-sale. So that's the first point is for us to keep talking with one another and learning from each other. Uh, Another second important point is that point-of-sale tobacco control policy, I really see it as a frontier uh, in tobacco control. There's been a lot more energy around it uh, in recent years. And I don't think point-of-sale is just for uh, states that already, for example, have a very high tax or a very strong clean and air law. So let me be really clear. There are evidence-based solutions that we know work in tobacco control. Uh, We like to raise the price of tobacco products. We pass strong smoke-free laws. We secure our program funding. We offer hard-hitting media campaigns, and we make cessation services available at the population level. All of those things are very, very important, and we should never uh, lose sight of those. Uh, however, what I'm finding and what I see is that point of sale can be used as a way to re-energize those core components of a comprehensive tobacco control program. So we'll hear from, on the podcast today, we'll hear from Cassandra in Minnesota and from Derek in San Francisco about their groundbreaking work in point of sale. Uh, and that also, though, there are other states will say you know, I'm preempted, I don't know if I can do point of sale, or gosh, my tax is really low, or I really do need to strengthen my smoke-free law. And I would say gathering up community members to have them see exactly what the tobacco industry is doing in the retail environment in terms of product availability, uh, product pricing and price promotions, flavorings, candy and fruit flavors, including menthol, Uh, the strategic, uh, very high density of tobacco retail outlet locations in low-income and minority communities. All of these are things that the tobacco industry is doing to perpetuate the problem. 
and bringing community members and decision makers together to do environmental scans and understand what's happening in the retail setting can be a really good way to re-energize the whole movement. Uh, I like to use an example out of Alabama uh, where we did some point of sale training recently for local public health grantees. Uh, and after a round of community assessments of the retail environment, uh, they were motivated to strengthen the smoke-free law as an immediate step uh, in beginning to protect the citizens uh, from the tobacco industry and from the social norms that promote tobacco use. So I'll stop there. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we can learn from each other, and I really hope Point of Sale continues to be uh, an energizing part of comprehensive tobacco control. Thank you, Allison. I know in Rhode Island we have used your resources as well as the resources of your sister organization, Counter Tobacco. Um, we have implemented your community surveys, so thank you for um, your your comments that it's, uh, it's a valuable opportunity to engage your community members in this work. Um, next, I would like to introduce Cassandra Stepan. Cassandra is the local tobacco policy planner for the Minnesota Department of Health Tobacco Prevention and Control Program. She leads the development and administration of local tobacco policy initiatives, including the Technical Assistance and Training Program. Cassandra, welcome, and thank you for briefing us on your work in Minnesota. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, this is, as she said, this is Cassandra Steppen from the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, I have the honor of working with a lot of local coalitions and local public health on their tobacco policies um, across the board. But one thing that um, that is is unique um, here in Minnesota is that we are one of three entities that fund local initiatives, um, but also MDH, Minnesota Department of Health, does also implement a statewide tobacco. Uh, technical assistance and training program. Um, Minnesota is unique in that it had a pretty early start working on point of sale or other point of sale type initiatives dating back to the mid 1990s. Um, these projects were a little different from what we consider point of sale now, uh, and they really focused on counter marketing. Um, you may have heard of the program Target Market. Um, we had local programs as well that were engaging youth. Um, and working with organizations to adopt tobacco-free funding policies. But, however, after the 2009 Family Smoking Prevention Act, uh, Minnesota began to explore this new frontier of point-of-sale strategies that focus on different ways that the tobacco industry markets their products in the store through promotions, enticing flavors, and um, pricing strategies, just to name a few. Um, you know, as Allison started uh, talking about, you know, states have a pretty clear playbook when it comes to tobacco control, um, especially the evidence about what works. Um, so Allison mentioned smoke-free air, high tobacco prices, media, cessation, things like that. But that necessarily, you know, isn't the case for, for point of sale, especially since 2009 uh, when we had this new authority. Um, so it, I guess I, I would also say that the number of point-of-sale policy options can be extremely overwhelming <laughs> and very complicated and very unique depending on where you live. So uh, folks like uh, those in Minnesota at the community level really had to build um, our own playbook and prioritize our policy initiatives that really fit um, with, with the situations that we were dealing with. Um, in 2011, 2011, uh, MDH leveraged CDC funds uh, to launch a new project, and that project really focused on collecting data about the retail environment and mapping uh, retailer locations using the Counter Tools software. We've had a long partnership with Counter Tools and very proud of that. Um, and also a part of this long assessment phase that, that the grantees at the local level went through is assessing their, their, um, their legal landscape um, and also identifying opportunities for improvement or local momentum for, for health uh, initiative work. This model that we, that we worked with in 2011 um, and a few years after really relied heavily on a robust team of experienced TA providers. 
we had folks uh, not only from the legal standpoint, the software standpoint for collecting data at Counter Tools, but we also had a lot of involvement from MDH staff as well as um, from experienced advocates that had been working in tobacco control for many, many years, helping um, the local public health agencies in this grant program um, succeed. So it was, it was a successful um, project. Even though CDC funding did end um, for this project, we continued on. Um, and we actually took the opportunity to go through a nine-month process with counter tools to help us figure out what exactly we learned and how we can apply it um, to future grant programs. Um, some of the activities um, that I would encourage other state health programs to go through in, in when they're developing their point of sale initiative is really, you know, collect the lessons from the field. Know where uh, folks um, have been and where they want to go. Um, do a lot of interviews with stakeholders that may have, you know, um, an interest in this area and may be affected by by point of sale initiatives, and also um, rely on the experts like Dr. Myers um, to review the empirical um, evidence and the case studies and help advise um, what uh, strategy direction that you want to go in is applicable for your state. Um, so we had six overarching changes uh, to our to our model or our process, if you will, that essentially guided us uh, to streamline our policy focus and also build an even more robust TA and training program um, here in the state for our locals. Strengthening these things ultimately has led to success uh, because we do have a laser focus on building the community's capacity of, of local public health and also their partners and strengthening our collective impact um, as a state as, and as individual communities to protect youth and other disparately impacted populations from the harms of tobacco. I am, I am very proud to say that um, our community partners have passed um, some really innovative policy initiatives that have, that have really led the nation. Um, one of the few states that have had the opportunity to work on innovative point of sale policies, such as um, limiting where flavored products can be sold, regulating the minimum size and pack, uh, price and pack size, excuse me, of little cigars. Um, and also working intensely on where retailers can be located and the density um, in a certain community. We also um, had communities for the very first time in the nation regulate um, e-cigarettes, where they can be used and how they can be sold. So in summary, I would, I would recommend to other states um, the, the key factors that are, that are really contributing uh, to, to a lot of communities' success here is having a strong state-level TA system having tools uh, where they can intensively um, dive into the data, collect data, and analyze it. Um, and then also having a strong vision from the funder. Um, MDH, as I said, is one of three, but we have a vision for our grantees and our grant programs, and that really helps guide um, the, the local communities in determining what, what areas to focus in on. Great. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, I think that you're giving great advice. Um, like Allison, you emphasize the importance of engaging local stakeholders um, and providing them with technical assistance and training for capacity building, and then engaging experts uh, for tools and strategy. I think that is, uh, provides a great roadmap uh, for other states who want to uh, work on this, either starting or advancing local policy work. So thank you. I would now like to introduce the podcast's final speaker, Derek Smith. Derek is director of the Tobacco Free Project at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, where he focuses on community-based public health interventions that build and support coalitions and engage local partners in public health-focused norm change. He has recently focused on policy and education related to Tobacco 21, smoke-free housing, electronic cigarettes, retail tobacco sales density limitations to support health equity, and expanding cessation services. Thank you so much, Derek, for joining today's podcast.
Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, greetings from San Francisco. I am going to talk a little bit about um, not just the, the work that we've been doing at the point of sale in San Francisco, but sort of how we do that and the, the package that, that we use to engage community, kind of building on what Cassandra said about uh, capacity building in the community, engaging the right partners to make sure that we're countering um, the targeting of the industry that happens at the point of sale. First, I'll talk a little bit, just give a plug for our community action model. It's a San Francisco-based model uh, that really engages community. It's a bit like um, community-based participatory research, but the purpose of it is to create lasting change, not to do research, but to create some change in the community. And um, more information about the community action model can be found on our website, uh, sftobaccofree.org. I'm going to talk about a couple policies that we've engaged and actually adopted in San Francisco with the partnership of community-based organizations. Uh, the first being in 2004 um, when San Francisco engaged in the adoption of a tobacco retail license. So we've now had that on the books for 13 years and we've found that um, engaging and adopting a tobacco retail license really has driven down uh, illegal sales um, to minors. Uh, it's required all tobacco retailers to obtain a license and abide by um, local laws as well as state and federal laws, and we found it to be a success. It was also a success in engaging a community-based organization to collect data and establish the problem and then engage uh, their local policymakers um, to the solution, which was a tobacco retail license. Building on that, several years ago in 2010, uh, we engaged some community-based organizations, particularly in um, minority, minority communities, African-American and low-income communities, where we did some data collection and we found that at the retail level, the stores available to folks were selling plenty of tobacco and alcohol and unhealthy food products, but there was really minimal access to fresh produce and healthier, like whole grain um, breads and tortillas. Um, and so we worked with these community partners to kind of start doing some data collection and come to some conclusions about how we could make the retail environment and the, the point of sale for tobacco as well as other items uh, more uh, appropriate and more health supporting for the community. From there in 2010, uh, the Healthy Retail Ordinance in San Francisco was adopted. The Healthy Retail Ordinance in San Francisco works with existing stores that previously were selling only products that would discourage health like alcohol, tobacco, and unhealthy food products and, and adds them to our set of health promoting um, partners by offering produce and, and other products. These stores through the ordinance can receive small business development assistance like loans and, and move themselves toward healthy retail as well as creating an economic benefit by expanding the offerings that they have. And then finally in 2015, we partnered with a community organization of youth uh, that looked at a, a major social justice issue related to uh, tobacco at the point of sale. These youth organizations found that communities of color and low-income uh, neighborhoods had a considerable amount more stores in their neighborhoods. Sometimes communities of the same size had four times as many retailers of tobacco compared to other communities. Uh, because of this social justice concern, um, the youth did data collection and created a framing that uh, established the concept of putting a cap on the number of tobacco retailers in the community. Uh, since then, it's been 18, more than 18 months since we've adopted this ordinance, we've seen an overall 9% attrition in the total number of stores um, that are selling tobacco products, and that's actually most prominent in the communities that were the most overrepresented um, with point-of-sale tobacco products. That includes our Chinatown neighborhood as well as our Tenderloin, which is a lower-income um, area of San Francisco. Um, as you can see, we've had some success in engaging community partners and really tackling hard issues that have a social justice frame but really work at the point of sale of tobacco, and we can see a considerable number of opportunities moving forward. Some of those include uh, menthol and e-cigarette flavors, um, working toward a minimum pack size to um, avoid the sale of uh, cheap cigarillos and blunts as well as minimum pricing, and really trying to expand the successes that have existed with the Healthy Retail Program, where we can partner with store owners and managers uh, to create these places of health that are kind of oases in the middle of what were previously food deserts. I think that's it for me. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you, Derek. Um, your 
comments were, were really valuable. And um, the common theme among all uh, three speakers um, seems to be engaging your community partners. Um, you know, Derek, the impact of the tobacco retail license um, in lowering youth um, buy rates, I think, is is really great for people to hear, um, as well as the coordination that you had with um, he healthy retail ordinances and engaging youth um, in social justice work that led to policy development. Um, all three of you have provided really um, great inspiration um, for our tobacco control members, so I appreciate um, that you uh, have been part of this podcast. Uh, so that concludes this podcast, and I'd like to, again, just take the opportunity to thank Allison Myers, Cassandra Stepan, and Derek Smith for joining me today. As a reminder, you'll be able to find all of the podcasts uh, in the 2016-2017 series and a host of other Tobacco Control Network resources by visiting the TCN website, www.tobaccocontrolnetwork.org and clicking on the Resources tab. Questions about the podcast series or any other features of the TCN website can be directed to the TCN inbox at tcn at Thank you so much for listening, and be well.